Um, so I've broken it out into common pests and less common pests. And so when I thought of, you know, what were the common pests of be beans and peas, there's really two, uh, spider mites and thrips. But there's a little bit longer list of those that are less common. So uh, I'll start with the more common ones and then get to some of these less common ones. Okay, so starting with spider mites. And you may be familiar with these little arachnids. You know, they have eight legs. Um, and our most common is the two-spotted spider mite. It's got these two darkened areas on either side of its body. And this picture in the middle is showing their eggs. And so you really need a uh, hand lens to see these mites. So this picture on the right just shows the size comparison between an aphid, which I'm sure you all are familiar with, and a spider mite. So you can see it's about a quarter the size of an aphid. Um, so as the mites feed, they suck out chlorophyll and they leave this kind of silvery appearance to the foliage initially. And we can also call that stippling as the damage gets a little bit worse over time. And then where the populations really increase, which they will in this hot weather that we're having, this is they thrive in the hot weather, um, then the whole plant will just turn brown, bronzed, um, and obviously the plant will not be able to produce good uh, beans. So you can see here the, the quite a bit of damage on uh, the beans. And if you look in this area of the leaves, um, it looks, you know, like there's some things stuck in some webbing. Well, that webbing is caused by the spider mites. So that's hence, that's what gives them their name. Uh, so when you're looking for spider mite uh, activity, and again, they're pretty common on the beans, you wanna start with the lowest leaves first because they spend the winter in ground cover. And in the spring, if there's no weeds around, they're gonna go straight for your crops. Um, so on this leaf here, there's a tiny, tiny bit of stippling damage in this area of the leaf. And so that is what you would want to initially look for. And then you, if you found it, you would want to catch those spider mites early and take care of them. Um, but looking on the underside of the leaf, then you might be able to see there's a spider mite right here in this circle. And on the right, I mentioned that webbing that they form. It often catches a lot of dirt. Um, and other debris. And so it looks dirty on the undersides of the leaves where the spider mites occur. Um, just as one thing to note is that um, there are predatory mites that are pretty common as well as the uh, pest spider mites. So the predatory mites have a little bit more of an oval uh, or sorry, pear shape to the body whereas the pest mites are more oval and the predatory mites move very quickly. You might've seen in that video of moving so fast. Um, and they do not obviously have the two spots. So when you're looking for the pest mites, also look for those beneficial predatory mites. Uh, so managing mites, of course, monitor early, um, but they do thrive in hot, dry, dusty conditions. Um, the dusty conditions is, be, they thrive in the dust because that actually prevents the predatory mites from finding the spider mites. It's not that they do better in the dust, it's just it prevents the spider mite or the predatory mite activity. Uh, for any commercial producers connected here, uh, miticides would be your best option for taking care of the spider mites. Um, you, don't, you do not want to use anything, any pyrethroid. So that's anything that ends in the letters T-H-R-I-N. Um, and backyard folks, or if you wanted to go organic, is a horticultural oil. So like a 1% concentration. But that oil would need to come into contact with the mites to uh, desiccate their bodies. All right, and I mentioned thrips being the other main pest of the spider mite. So they're also a tiny, tiny insect. They're winged. Um, their wings are feathery, which you wouldn't often see, but they do have this long slender body. 
And their damage looks similar to the spider mite damage in that it causes this uh, white stippling area. But I tend to think of it more as um, patches of bleached areas on the foliage that are more sporadic on the edges of the leaves or in the interior of the leaves where spider mites tend to eventually cover the entire leaf uh, area for feeding. So with thrips, this view of the image here shown on the left is a single thrip feeding on the leaf. And what they do is they, their mouth parts, they scrape the cells off the epidermis and then they'll suck up the contents. And so that's why you get this bleached pattern to the foliage. Um, but these little black dots that are shown on the right are uh, the thrips excrement. And so that's another great way to determine if thrips is causing the damage. So on the far right are nymphs and in the middle is an adult. So they look very similar. So here is some damage to peas, which we have mostly seen uh, thrips on. And on the left, there's a teeny tiny thrips on this uh, the pod here, and you can see the damage that they've caused, this uh, kind of silvering to the pod. And on the right, on the foliage, if you just look at this area, now I'm not zoomed in, so just from a distance, hopefully you can see that there are just some little black dots within the whitened area. And that again is the thrips poop. And so in some cases, you don't even need a hand lens to know that, the, that it's thrips causing the damage. You just look for those black dots of excrement. So managing thrips, you know, you could uh, go all the way and get sticky traps where you could catch the adults. There, if you go online and look for sticky traps, you'll find that there are blue traps that people say, okay, these are for thrips only, but I just use the yellow sticky traps for everything. And you don't need to worry about a blue trap that's specifically for thrips. If you are interested in this, just yellow sticky trap is fine. And the thrips on the trap are gonna be the tiniest little things on there. Um, so you probably would need a hand lens to see the thrips from what might be even plant debris. So just a close-up view of what they might look like is shown there on that lower image. Again, that long slender body. Okay, so thrips, they'll feed on a wide, wide host range. So if you can get rid of some uh, other weed crops or weeds in the area, um, clean up your crop debris, even diversifying the crops in the area is good. Um, but sometimes you might need to apply a pesticide. And one of the best is an organic, it's spinosad. So there are some commercial options like conserve and then a whole host of options for the backyard garden that you can get in any garden center. Other options, insecticidal soap, which again, you can also get at any garden center, or I already mentioned the oil for the spider mites. So they would work on the thrips as well. Um, but with the oil, you wouldn't want to use it in where temperatures are going to be above 85 degrees for four hours following the application. So it's best to apply it at night or super early in the morning. Uh, just finally about thrips, um, this is another kind of advanced IPM step, and that is to use a trap plant. Um, now, what I'm showing here in this picture was actually some research on greenhouse uh, crops in, uh, out of University of Vermont, but it could be something that could be useful if you are growing peas in a high tunnel um, or if you have your peas outdoors, you wanna try something different. So what they did was they used marigold. Um, it's one of the most attractive plants to thrips. So they used that as their trap plant. And then they released these beneficial predatory mites on the marigold plants. So the, the marigold was bringing in the thrips to feed on the pollen and the predatory mites were then feeding on the thrips themselves. So as a way to, re to reduce that population. 
I'll skip that. All right, so less common pests. So there's a lot of uh, caterpillar type pests and then a few other insects and then some diseases. So if you look at the a video on the top right, you're probably familiar with the cabbage looper if you grow the coal crops and you're, you know their movement is that looping type of fashion. Well, the alfalfa looper, which has a huge host range, not just alfalfa, uh, but it includes beans, might be one that you would find on your uh, bean crops. So it's a similar looking green with white stripes down its body. And it will tend to feed these or create these ragged circles within the plant or uh, ragged feeding on the edges of the plant. Um, so the alfalfa looper, it overwinters in the soil and um, the moths emerge in late spring and it has about four generations over the summer. So it may be seen on the plants later in the season. So that's one uh, caterpillar you may see on your beans. And another one are the army worms. Um, we could have two different kinds, the beet army worm uh, or the Western yellow striped. And again, these are under the le less common pests. So they're um, you know, not something you're gonna see every day. Um, but both of these, the egg mass would look like a little fuzzy um, blob on the underside of, the, of a foliage. Um, because it's, it's covered with uh, cottony scales, protection from predators, and it will hatch into 40, 50 young caterpillars. And they will feed, similar to the other caterpillars, creating these ragged circles in the middle of the leaves. Um, but they're often recognized by these darker colors with the stripes down either side of the body. So quite different from the, um, the looper, the alfalfa looper. And then cutworms might also be an issue on beans. Um, the Western bean cutworm is one that's gonna specifically feed on the bean pod, not necessarily on the foliage. So this one, um, if you uh, found say a hole in your bean pod and you opened up the pod and didn't find anything inside, you might suspect the Western bean cutworm because it's only active at night. It, uh, during the day, it hides in the soil in uh, protected areas, and then it will start feeding at night. So that's another thing. If you're finding chewing damage, but you don't see any insects at all, you might wanna suspect these other insects that only feed at night. So this is mainly, a, like I said, a pod feeding caterpillar. And a lot of these, yes, will feed on potatoes as well. So they, pretty, they have a pretty broad host range. Another one you might not suspect on your beans is corn earworm. You're probably familiar with it as a major pest of corn, but we have seen it also feeding again on the pods of uh, the beans. Um, and it's recognized by these bright kind of shiny black dots on the surface of the body of the caterpillar. So again, this will be another pest that would be more active later in the season. It's not really an early season pest. Okay, so just some of the examples of caterpillar pests. So for, in terms of managing them, they're again, pretty rare to find. If you do, you're not gonna find them in super high populations um, unless there are some specific cases where these say army worms are migrating from one field to another. But the weeds, grasses, debris all serve as reservoirs for shelter, um, overwintering sites. So just keeping a clean garden space and then um, hand picking the larvae. And that might mean actually going out at night uh, with your flashlight to see if they're, if you can find them feeding depending on what you're looking for. Um, you can shake the plants, try and dislodge the larvae from the foliage and then kill them that way. Um, cut worms, maybe scratch the soil at the base of the plant with a cultivator and see if you can turn up the larvae uh, from the surface of the soil during the day. Uh, but if at all needed, if there's some kind of 
outbreak. Um, probably the best option if you catch the larvae when they're small. And by small, I'm just going to go back to this picture. I mean, when they're um, pretty newly hatched, less than half an inch in, in length. So in that size, then using BT, Bacillus thuringiensis, and there's a couple of different strains, is going to work best because the larvae need to eat the BT for it to work. Um, and then there are some other options as well. Earwigs is one that you guys are familiar with, has such a broad host range. Um, it's really just kind of recognizing the feeding damage that earwigs cause to recognize what uh, is causing the damage. So earwigs tend to just leave um, very rough, ragged areas of feeding behind. Sometimes it will be a large portion of the leaf will be gone. Sometimes they're leaving, um, they're feeding just on the surface of the leaf. So it's really, there's no rhyme or reason or pattern to the uh, chewing damage that they're causing. It's very rough. Um, so of course, you turn the leaf over, look on the other side, there's nothing there, then maybe you might suspect cutworms um, or earwigs because they're, they're active at night. And I'm actually gonna move through this. I had a little bit more about earwigs. I'm gonna move through that. We can talk about it later um, just to get through it all. So another pest that Nick could maybe chime in if he's ever seen this before, but um, is pea weevils. So it's actually a weevil. It's a very short, short, uh, stout body, the long nose. And the adult overwinters in protected areas. And when she emerges in spring, she lays eggs on the newly developing pod, right on the surface of the pod. And the larvae hatch straight into the pod and they feed within the, uh, the seeds. So with this pest, there's only one weevil that grub basically that would be in each seed. Um, and if you're collecting the pods and you have the seeds and put them in storage and all of a sudden see these weevils crawling around, well, that's likely this pea weevil and the infestation occurred in the field, not in storage. Um, it does take them, once these larvae hatch and move into the seed, it takes them about eight weeks. So it's a very long period of development and there's one generation per year. So with these, it's tricky um, because the management, you know, there's different insecticides that could be used, is right after bloom. And so with the plants that are kind of blooming in a staggered fashion, it's uh, not as easy to manage for um, wherever this occurs in higher numbers. But I do know where it does occur, it can infest every pot, uh, seed in, in the pods of a for certain farm. So it has the potential to, to be a major pest. Mexican bean beetle is another one that uh, does, it doesn't overwinter here, but it can migrate north. Um, but you know, our winters have actually been more and more mild as the years go on. So this is one that would has the potential to be able to survive over the winter and be more of a pest throughout the season. So the Mexican bean beetle is in the same family as our beloved lady beetles. The eggs look the exact same, this bright, bright yellow. Um, the larvae though look quite different with the yellow color and the black spines. And then uh, their pupae look quite similar. And when the adults emerge from the pupae, they initially don't have any spots on their bodies, but over time they will turn a darker red color uh, with about 10 spots on the back. But they can, in high numbers, cause quite a bit of damage. They tend to feed, the larvae tend to feed just on the surface of either the top or the bottom of the foliage. So it causes what we call window pain, 
damage where uh, it's not completely through the foliage, it hasn't made some holes yet. But over time, the foliage will rip um, or they'll chew all the way through. So this was some research out of Virginia Tech, and they were just looking at different options for managing this beetle. Uh, one was using different types of um, weed barrier or plastic mulch under the plants. And so where they had no plastic mulch or they had black, there was a lot of damage. But where they used uh, white plastic, there was hardly any damage. So that was quite interesting to see the difference between the three and that's all the same variety. And then there are differences in variety um, preference, I guess you could say, for the bean beetles where the, um, the non-waxed varieties are more susceptible than the waxed varieties. And also the lima beans are um, not, as, not as susceptible either. So I'm not sure if I worded that right, but the waxed varieties are more susceptible than the non-waxed or the lima beans. And then they found uh, plenty of predators too that are attacking the Mexican bean beetles like our um, predatory stink bug, which we have in Utah and lady beetles too. <laughs> Okay, so just in terms of how this pest is managed, um, sometimes planting early or even late varieties can es escape that attack. Um, using some resistant varieties, as I've already mentioned, the um, non-wax varieties are more resistant. Hand removing beetles. And then they have developed an insect, an insect threshold for uh, needing to apply an insecticide. And that is uh, going out in the field scouting. And if one, uh, more than one adult per two plants is found or more than one egg mass per single foot of row are found. So it's pretty low number of insects as a threshold for damage, which kind of tells you that they can definitely cause a lot of injury when they're present. Uh, but they are pretty easily controlled with that BT or the spinosad. So those are the uh, leaf feeding beetles that are susceptible to that spinosad again, which is organic. Okay, now I'm just gonna finish up with some diseases that um, have been seen in Utah. So there's a couple of bacterial diseases, um, bacterial blight. So look at this plant, looks pretty healthy, but you can see on the tips of the leaves, there is something going on that's scorching those leaves. And on closer view, it's damaging the leaves from the tip in. And it seems to be affecting a lot of the more succulent foliage. So this is that bacterial uh, blight. And really it's going to be an issue where there is overhead irrigation uh, and on cooler temperatures. So overhead irrigation or rain under cooler temperatures. So another one that's not gonna be common, but again, we have seen it in Utah. A related bacterial disease is bacterial spot. So this is caused by Pseudomonas. And this bacterial called Pseudomonas uh, has such a wide host range of plants and it's a, ub a ubiquitous pathogen. So it just survives over the winter on plant debris that was already infected the prior year. And it's, it doesn't cause that kind of blotchy damage. It is, it is more of a spot injury, but it's the same situation where uh, there needs to be lots of moisture, either overhead irrigation or rain and cooler temperatures. So just a closer view of a fresh bacterial spot and you'll usually always see this yellow halo around those spots. Sometimes the pods can be affected as well. Um, and those spots over the right conditions will just continue to spread and then you'll get the scorching of the foliage. Um, just with management of these diseases, with all diseases, it's basically rotate your crops, make sure you have clean, clean seed um, plant debris that was already infested from the year before, removing that as well.
Um, a couple of viruses that we do have in Utah, one is called bean common mosaic virus. And this one is spread by aphids. So it doesn't need to be a specific aphid species. It's just any aphid that would feed on a plant that already has the virus can then transmit it to another plant um, and introduce the virus to that plant. So it causes the foliage tissue to sort of take on a light green to dark green pattern of coloration. And you also have this puckering of the foliage as well. Um, on the left is a plant that was infected late in its growth stage. And so uh, a plant like this would probably still produce a decent amount of uh, beans um, because not the entire plant is not infested, but the plant on the right was, uh, a, inter, the virus was introduced when the plant was very young. And so a plant like that would probably die or just not be viable and should be removed right away. This is a field not in Utah, this is um, in the Midwest, but it just kind of demonstrates with that spread, with the aphids being able to spread the virus that it can go throughout a field pretty quickly if those infested plants aren't removed. Um, so we've also seen the curly top virus on beans. So that is a disease hopefully you guys are familiar with on your tomatoes and your peppers. It's spread by the beet leafhopper, um, but beans are also a host. And um, typically it's a virus that will end up in the death of the plant. So not one that you, you would wanna leave in the field or wait to see if it produces anything, um, but it causes this severe chlorosis, curled leaves, and eventual uh, scorching of the leaves and dieback. So again, remove those plants quickly and make sure you have disease-free seed. Uh, some plants will show that resistance uh, labeled on the, the plant or the seed packet. I'm going to skip this last one because I just wanted to point out one last thing. A few years ago, uh, the USU organic farm was growing fava beans. And it was just a little interesting situation where they had this weevil, and this is called the pea leaf weevil. So different from the weevil that I just talked about, where the adults feed on the outer edge of the leaves. And uh, this is the adult here. It's teeny tiny, um, less than a quarter of inch long. But the larvae or the grubs, remember with the pea weevil feed on the seeds or the pods, these weevils feed on the root nodules um, of the plant underground. And so as a result, they're feeding on those areas that do the nitrogen fixation. And so these plants were just stunted, chlorotic and so they were damaged not only from the weevil on the leaves, but the weevils on the roots. But the other thing that was a problem was that the weevils were introducing another pathogen uh, called botrytis. And normally not something you would see in the field, but there was this, again, introduction from the feeding of the, the weevils. So the botrytis just caused the plants to have blotchy areas, completely wilt over, um, affected the pods, the leaves, the stems. And here you can see an example of where the beetle was, oh, the weevil was feeding and then had introduced this pathogen in the feeding areas. And from there it just spread. So shows the importance of monitoring for uh, your pests and also that maybe it's never one thing that's causing the problem. Um, just a couple of resources. Nick has uh, done a lot of work putting together some info on our uh, integrated pest management website. So he does have a page set up for uh, bean and pea pests. So you can just Google Utah IPM common legume pests. And I'm not sure how helpful this would be um, because there's this is out of Kentucky, but a lot of the pests I talk about are, are in this um, scouting guide. 
So you could Google IPM scouting guide for legume pests.